Well, we'd located one bird up in a tree and knew where he was at, so we decided to drive around and look for some more. After seeing a few far off in a field, we decided the first bird was the best one to go after. She pointed at this sunflower plant from the year before, and it, it looked like there was pipe cleaner after it. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await. It can be argued that this is the greatest sound of spring. But for a while, this sound was absent in Minnesota. But then in 1971, the Minnesota DNR traded rough grouse for eastern wild turkeys with the state of Missouri. The hardy birds thrived and exploded across the state. Today, they can be found from the Iowa border all the way up to Canada. The big birds are popular for their table fare. Their aggressive displays that can happen during a hunt and the chance to layer up in camo during the spring. But for diehards, one of their favorite traits of this wary species is the wide range of vocalizations that become a part of the chase. Yelps, clucks, putts, and gobbles. These are maybe the most common sounds you might be familiar with, but these talkative turkeys have over two dozen different vocalizations. To poorly explain what I do for a living, <laughs> I make animal noises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We joined Corey and Lucas Carlos on a hunt that featured a wide range of animal sounds. Well, it's early. Uh, we're gonna get in the Jeep and we're gonna go for a cruise. We're gonna locate some birds that are hopefully gobbling on the roost. You haven't shot a turkey before? Nope. Really? All right. We learn an experience. Just gonna put a game plan together because we didn't get scouting early enough last night. So we don't really know where any birds are roosted, but they should be gobbling. It's a nice, clear, high pressure, sunny day. Um, that should mean they should be gobbling up on the roost pretty good, pretty fired up. We'll find them, get them. What's for breakfast? Granola bars and caffeinated bubbly. Well, we'd located one bird up in a tree and knew where he was at, so we decided to drive around and look for some more. After seeing a few far off in a field, we decided the first bird was the best one to go after. And then as we were planning our attack, we spotted one more. There's one running right there. That's oh, yeah. him. So he was heading to this guy. Nothing goblin. What's got him so tight-lipped? While this Tom was being stubborn, we knew he was in there. So we geared up and headed after him.
In addition to a couple of noisy sandhill cranes, we had three interested turkeys. Now it's just a matter of getting Lucas and the decoy within their eyesight. While cameras can make distances look deceiving, Lucas was waiting for these birds to get in a little bit closer so they could be within effective range of the 410. They were starting to go in the opposite direction, so Corey tried to coax them in a little closer. After a tense 10 minute standoff, they finally decided something wasn't right and took off. How close do you think they got? 70 yards, 60 yards. A little too far for the four tap. <sighs> I'd have just ran out there and jumped on them. Maybe next time. I think you can catch them. They have large talons, so if you're planning on jumping on one, you want leather gloves. It was off to find some new birds and some new strategies. Let's get out and around them and then come in from that way.
deserve to live. <laughs> Looked like a lot of work. Yeah, that was not ideal. Could have killed Jake. Yeah. But no, I got one too many layers on. I bet. Well, it's 22 degrees this morning. So. <laughs> Couldn't sweet talk them. Couldn't fight with them. And when they were out there, and they gobbled towards us. The one was looking right at us, and he was like 100 some yards away, gobbled right at us, and he could barely hear it. Yeah. It's like he wasn't fired up at all. Like he just barely. It sucked, you couldn't see anything off the ground there. No. And all of a sudden, you see a couple heads here. It's like, yeah. While day one yielded no fresh turkey for the flat top, Smash! Smash! it was an exciting experience nonetheless full of all sorts of wildlife encounters. But we decided to get a little more serious for day two and split up. That meant I got to carry a gun as well. up here today I know back home it's gonna be close to 80 and I'm overdressed it was cold yesterday 22 degrees yesterday but it's gonna be a warm one today boys well after chasing those gobbles for a while I never found that bird and I was sweating so bad it was time to take a break for lunch but we knew there were toms around so we headed back out there in the afternoon it is hot like 84 degrees Check this out, ladies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Try to control yourselves. So we're back where we were this morning, and um, there was toms around here, and they were actually starting to work their way into the woods as the day warmed up. And now that it's 84 degrees, there's probably at least four toms around here. We're going to cut into the woods and see if we can't find them, get in some shade. And uh, while Corey and Lucas are somewhere else, I, you know, they, they said it was a competition. <laughs> they said it was a competition, and they sent you and I out who have no clue where we're going. Well, they send us back to a place we hunted this morning, yeah. and already, they're going and they're going to a new around. place, yeah. a new secret place. Yeah, I already pushed them around once, but, you know, they'll go to their secret place, but I'm not worried about that. Ah, let's go get them. Yep. Here we go. It turns out we had nothing to worry about. While Corey and Lucas were having success somewhere else, it didn't take us long to find that Tom I'd heard earlier and for Steve to call it in close. It took that Tom forever to come across the field to where we were hiding out. And because I was starting to stiffen up while I was waiting, I had to set the camera down to get the job done. I'll be honest, I'm shaking a little bit right now. Yeah. <laughs> and part of it is because I held that pose for so long and I thought I, you know, you always misjudge your pose. Like, oh, I'll have time to rearrange a little oh, bit I'm, before I'm he gets here. I'm comfortable. Should be a big deal, right? Yeah. Well, we sat back there and we spotted that Tom. We actually spotted him first out over there by that tree. He crossed the field and then we met up with him. We saw him there. Steve started calling. Nice job calling, by the way. Hey, thank you. Brought him right into 35 yards. Got to shoot the 20 gauge with the boss Tom. And we got ourselves a turkey dinner. Woo! What's the thought process here, Mr. Loeffler? Well, I want to keep the skin and fat on there because skin and fat is always good. So we're going to just pluck the breast on this, pull the breast off, and then we're going to peel the skin back and get the thighs and the legs and drummies. There's a bunch of meat on the back, and then I'll pull the carcass out of here too. Make some turkey stock out of that because that's delicious. Mm -hmm. For people that haven't cut up a turkey, they might be surprised at 
like the first time I killed a turkey and cut the breast out, I was kind of surprised where the breast where the breast was. Yeah, in a honker, it's like you, it's more right here, right at the base of the neck. On a breast, uh, on a turkey, it's like in between the legs almost, way down here. It's crazy how much different anatomy wise birds that spend more time in the air versus birds that spend lots of time on the ground and we are gonna fry up some turkey wraps tonight gravity's gonna take that bacon grease this way so it's just kind of basting it with bacon grease but just sear it up that bottom side a little bit slice them up dice them up Redistribute them, roll them around in that bacon grease, season them up. We'll be eating some good turkey wraps before too long. By the sounds of it, turkeys are a lot of fun to hunt, and they're delicious too. So, for everyone that was part of the reintroduction process of turkeys into Minnesota, thank you very much. Once it's mature, it, it, it dies, and you're, you're left with the uh, with the brown fuzzy wrap around the, the stem. There's a lot of species of dodder in the world. So there are nine, nine species of dodder that are known in the state. Three were documented historically. You don't see it very often. If you go like to Michigan or Ohio, and in those states it's considered at least threatened because a lot of the prairies are gone. True or false, the majority of Minnesota's prohibited invasive species originally came from global commercial trading. True, two thirds of Minnesota's invasive species that are illegal to sell or possess came here through commercial pathways such as bait, horticulture, pet and food trades. To prevent the introduction of aquatic invaders in Minnesota waters, some species cannot be planted in backyard ponds or kept in a home aquarium. To make sure the species you are buying or selling are legal, check the Minnesota DNR's webpage, Trade Pathways for Invasive Species Introductions. We can prevent exotic species from invading our waters. Do not release non-native plants, fish, or animals into the environment. Donate your unwanted pet fish to a school or pet store, or advertise that you have fish to give away. Contact a local veterinarian for advice on disposing of unwanted pets. Never release aquarium fish into ponds, lakes, streams, or rivers, or flush them down the toilet. Only plant native species in your ponds and do not transport aquatic plants without a permit. Boaters and water recreationists can also help prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. It's a simple drill, clean in, clean out. Funding for this segment was provided by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Wright, Meeker, Yellow Medicine, Laquaparle, and Big Stone Counties. The Laquaparle Wildlife Management Area in Western Minnesota features 24,000 acres of grasslands, home to an abundance of native plant and bird species. The area became public lands in the 1930s when eminent domain transferred private property around Laquaparo Lake to the state as part of a flood control project. Upstream, the Minnesota River was dammed, which created Marsh Lake. The state-owned conservation lands eventually became a wildlife management area, state park, and game refuge. For decades, DNR crews have conducted prescribed burns on WMA lands to rejuvenate grasslands. Because native prairie plants have roots that reach down 10 feet or more, they survive fire. Shallow-rooted invasive plants do not. Some native species even need fire to germinate, so a controlled burn brings new life to a prairie. In 2017, Walt Gessler and his daughter Thea were hiking through the Laquaparle WMA after a spring burn when they discovered an unusual plant. 
my daughter happened to be find that we were out hiking and she pointed at this sunflower plant from the year before and it, it looked like there was pipe cleaner wrapped around it. A rather large pipe cleaner. I looked at it and I said, what the heck is this? And I, I wasn't sure and when she ended up, she took it back to uh, Iowa State and where she goes to college and had it identified and uh, did a little more reading on it and thought, well, that's kind of an interesting thing to see. It turned out to be a native rope daughter plant that makes its living on another plant's stem. Apparently it's, it's, a, it's an annual plant that seems to be, at least the stuff I've seen around here is associated with sunflowers. And it seems to be associated with some sort of a disturbance like prescribed burning. I think the seed was there, but I think that probably the burn you know, exposes the, the uh, litter and the duff and the soil is exposed and the seed starts to grow if the conditions are right. This spring, we did a prescribed burn on, on our uh, hospice and tract, and it was uh, quite common after that prescribed burn. The main objective of the plant is to find a host, and then once the, uh, the growing stem finds a host, then the, the root basically ceases to exist, and it just draws all of its resources from the host plant. Initially, when it first growing, it's gonna be like a, a yellow vine. It can be quite abundant, and it's growing and it's wrapping around the stems of the host plant. And then as it comes to a stage when it's flowering, it, it doesn't have leaves, it's just a single yellow stem. So it needs the plant to get its chlorophyll. If it was, if it was green, it wouldn't be needing the chlorophyll because it would be making it own. The rope daughter gets its common name from the plant's tiny white flowers that form a dense coil around a host plant's stem. When it flowers, it'll be a, a, a really a solid, almost a, a solid stem of just white flowers wrapped around it, and it'll those flowers will get pollinated and produce a seed, which will drop to the ground. And then once it's mature, it it, it dies, and you're, you're left with the uh, with the brown fuzzy wrapper on the, the stem. There's a lot of species of daughter in the world, so there are ni nine species of daughter that are known in the state. Three were documented historically. You don't see it very often. If you go like to Michigan or Ohio, and in those states it's considered at least threatened because a lot of their prairies are gone. So in that case, it's, a, it's become a situation where they've lost habitat. At one time, prairies were uh, represented a large segment of the landscape in Minnesota and for remnant prairies in Minnesota, we're down to our, our last 1%. So it's really <laughs> become very rare and, and remnant prairie is a, a very unique and special habitat in this state. Prescribed burning for prairie species, it stimulates the prairie and the plants that are found in it to, to actively grow. They know there's a, evolved with fire for, for centuries and the fire stimulates that growth. It, it releases nutrients, which the plants take advantage of. There's exposed soil, so the, the plants over, I guess, over time have e evolved to release and produce more seeds after a fire that can take advantage of these situations where, where seed, seed sites are available. There's an incredible seed bank down there, especially in these remnant prairies, and how and when things grow is sometimes even a surprise to us.
Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await.